Hello, and welcome to our show. My name is Stefano Viola, and I'm with Kimley Horn Associates. Today, we're here to talk about the new DEP stormwater rules that are rolling out this year. With me, I have Susan Stevens. Susan has been practicing environmental law for over 30 years, primarily focused on water resource law, and has been handling ERP program issues since its infancy. She is currently a shareholder in the Tallahassee office of Stearns, Weaver, and Miller. Additionally, I have Scott Weeks from Kimley Horn Associates. Scott has nearly 20 years of experience successfully designing and delivering complex surface water projects of all sizes for both public and private sectors. His experience has required him to permit many surface water projects with the local water management districts, and he is well versed in the respective water quality criteria. So the reason we are discussing the rule change today is because most construction projects need an ERP for operation and maintenance. Um, we've had a big problem with too many nutrients such as phosphorus and nitrogen getting into our Florida waterways, um, resulting in excessive algae growth and other problems. And the DEP has identified this and traced a lot of that back to the stormwater. So in 2020, the legislation directed DEP to amend the ERP rules to reduce the nutrient levels in stormwater. FDEP did so and adopted ERP rule and handbook revisions in March of 2023. And the legislator just ratified these changes during the last legislative session. So Susan, with these changes, the big picture, what do the ratify rules do? Well, they really changed the way uh, stormwater is regulated in the state. They went from a design-based um, program, we kind of do an off-the-shelf um, approach, and you replace that with performance space, where you have to demonstrate with calculations and modeling that your post-development nutrient loadings are less than your pre-development loadings. So it's really a, a, a significant change in the way the program is run and requires a lot more front-end effort and a lot of new solutions to um, achieve the goals that are set, which are basically a net improvement standard for most waters in this state. Um, that means, what I mean by that is your post has to be less than, your, than before the project got started when you, at the end of the day. Now, the rule does allow some more flexibility in how um, the, you know, the treatment options available, and uh, we're going to talk more about that in part two, so stay tuned. Uh, and, um, and the legislature kind of um, also added some um, provisions to make it easier on the regulated industry by grandfathering more um, projects and types of permits under the old um, design-based standards and also um, giving uh, some types of developments like redevelopment a lower standard that they have to hit. Why did the legislature have to approve these rule changes? <laughs> Frankly, just the cost. Um, the um, preliminary um, regulatory estimate that the department prepared estimated at, um, when these rules would go into effect, almost one and a quarter billion with a B um, in the first five years would be, would be the additional treatment costs. Now, there's some additional costs on top of that that we'll talk ab about again in part two, but that just by itself um, it, it equates out to the average of $2,600 additional cost per developed acre of each of each project. So that's significant. So they had to approve it, and uh, and that's why they came up with grandfathering um, additional grandfathering provisions to make it. A little bit easier. They um, also added a glide path for the rules, which we'll talk about again in a little bit, to give a longer lead time to come into compliance and give people the opportunity to still go under the old rules. So all of that was part of the uh, the way the legislature dealt with the additional costs. Understood. I mean, Scott, honestly, cost is impactful, but the rules, stormwater quality has been required since inception. So why the big fuss now? Yeah, Florida was one of the leaders in stormwater quality rules going back uh, to the to the early 80s. And the, the difference in this rule now is really the shift between um, treating uh, with presumptive criteria for total suspended solids to a nutrient removal based uh, criteria. And so the new rule establishes um, minimum uh, requirements for statewide for nutrient removal for uh, nitrogen and phosphorus to address those issues like you mentioned before. Uh, rule does a couple other things too with um, enhanced op operation maintenance requirements, inspection requirements, and so on. Um, but really one of the key things there is uh, the nutrient removal. I mean, you went over some, some percentages in that. Is this, the rule going to be statewide? Is it going to be for every project across the state equal? Yeah, so the rule does apply statewide, but the, the specific requirements for each project depends on the locality. Really, so um, the, what it means is that for a typical project, 80% uh, phosphorus removal, 55% nitrogen removal, 
is the standard. That's the minimum. Um, and that's not pre-post. That's from uh, the post-development condition. If you did nothing, you'd have to reduce it at least that much before discharging to a state water. But in addition to that, too, you can't discharge any more than what's happening in the pre-development uh, for nutrient loading. And so this is a, a different metric than we've been using uh, currently uh, for the, these requirements. Um, and, and that's just a typical project. Now, if you get into an impaired water body or an outstanding Florida water, uh, it's even higher regulations. Um, there is some exception when we come to um, redevelopment sites. Uh, the, the ratified rule gave some additional, uh, I guess, leniency or, or reduced the requirements a bit for those redevelopment sites. And so instead of hitting the... Um, the 80-55, it's a, it's a 80-45. Uh, and so there's a slight reduction there in the requirements. Got you. And um, Scott, as I recall, there's also uh, significant reductions in total suspended solids across the board. Aren't those mm -hmm. pretty significant? Yeah, so they're, the suspended solids is similar to, to now with the 80% reduction, but for those impaired water bodies, outstanding Florida waters, up to 95% reduction in total suspended solids, which is a significant um, requirement. And I, I wanted to point out to those of you that may have a redevelopment project, what we're talking about in how they define redevelopment is uh, an existing commercial, industrial, institutional, or residential type use. Uh, and then the redevelopment must um, reduce that in size or scale. And for those um, exempt ones, they have to be under an acre, not an acre or less, but under an acre. So it's, it's a very limited exemption, but if you're a redevelopment, you do have a little easier standard because they recognize that you have a limited space in which you can accomplish that stormwater treatment. Exactly. And earlier, you mentioned grandfathering. What are the projects that are not going to be required to follow this new rule change? Well, anything that's in the ground, any existing stormwater um, pond treatment um, facility that's already constructed you don't do not have to retrofit them to meet the new standards and also in addition to that um, any issued permit that's not yet expired uh, even if it even if the system hasn't been built yet if it's issued before the effective date of the rule uh, then it is under the old standards and that is an individual general or conceptual permit now, that also covers if you're making minor modifications, minor construction changes, minor modifications to the permits, those still get to go under the old standards as well, even if that's 5, 10, 15 years in the future. But that minor modification threshold is the same that's in the ERP rules today. And usually it's like if you're going to increase impervious surface by more than 10 percent or you make other changes like that that are going to have an um, adverse effect on water resources, then you're under the new standards and, and that um, grandfathering no longer applies. Now, conceptual permits, I wanted to point out a, a bit because unlike the minor modification, you can get your new brand new ERP for your subsequent phases of each um, that, that are under the umbrella of that conceptual permit, um, provided you meet what's already in the rules relative to um, does it qualify under the conceptual permit because it has to kind of follow the umbrella of the conceptual permit. Got it. And um, additionally, there are some other grandfathering for a number of public transportation projects, if you have your permit by the effective date or you have certain planning documents in that have been submitted um, by January 1st of 2024. And then there's a whole laundry list of things that the legislature added during ratification that, again, are designed to ease the path. And that's uh, basically if you have documents submitted for the local government agencies, but you don't have your ERP in hand, then a lot of those projects can be grandfathered. If you've, if you've got your building permit application and you've submitted your stormwater plans there, you're grandfathered. Or you have a planned unit development or development of regional impact, those are pretty significant undertakings at the local level. So once you get that development order, as long as you've, as long as you've had those things in place by January 1 of 2024, then you get to follow under those old rules, even when you're putting in new stormwater plans for new projects, provided they're under the umbrella of that older um, order. Now, some of those latter things, the you know, planned unit development and DRIs, they have an expiration date. You can only use the planned unit development for another 10 years. You get a 10-year window. And for DRIs, it's 20 years. Got it. 
So earlier we talked about glide path. Can you kind of elaborate on exactly what the glide path means? Oh, sure. Um, what the glide path means is if sitting here today you don't have your permit, if you submit a permit application for an individual or a general permit and you go through the request of in additional information with the department or the water management district, whoever's handling your permit, and you get to the end of the day and they tell you you're complete, they don't need any more information, then you get to go under the old rules. Um, they have, but you have to be complete by the effective date plus 18 months. And that effect, so, you know, it gives you that long of a time to get through the process. So you could say, oh my goodness, there's no way we can afford these rules. You can start the process and still be under the old rules um, 18 months from the effective date. So do you know when they're anticipating the effective rule to go into place? Well, it's still awaiting the governor's signature as of the taping of this. So by the time you see this, it could be have, have been signed uh, or it will be ineffective if, if it takes um, action without the governor's signature by July 1. So if we kind of estimate July 1, the 18 month period would be up in January of 2026. Got it. I mean, so we've covered a lot today. I mean, there's some, some significant changes come in. We need to stay up to date with that. What would you say are the key takeaways from this um, session that we've just provided? Yeah, one of the big ones is this rule is complicated. There's a lot of nuances to it. It's important that we understand um, for projects moving forward, all projects, unless they're exempt, have nutrient loading requirements and treatment. And so this is going to affect every project, and it's important to get ahead of it. And to the end of some projects are exempt, it's important to to pay attention to the timelines and those grandfathering options that I talked about where you go under the old rules and, and because your timeline is going to be running short. You, you have 18 months from the effective date, which we assume will be in July. It seems like a lot of time, but the department and the water management districts are going to get a lot of applications. There's going to be a lot of for them to have to work through, and that time is going to disappear quickly. So don't act, don't sit on um, your project. Go ahead and get it rolling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and transitioning to that new time, uh, the new standards, we are going to have uh, expected increased cost for stormwater. We'll get more into details of that in part two. And I think the important thing to recognize is you're going to need to involve your environmental professional early and involve your attorneys early to give you advice on the best path forward for your project. So this is important information that we've covered today. Really need to stay tuned for part two, because part two, we're going to get into some more detailed information on how we move forward with this DEP stormwater rule change. <music>